Hi, software engineers. Professor McBurney here, bringing you a concrete demonstration of the Python unit test library. This is something that is just to prepare you, uh, one, for writing unit tests in your project, but two, for how to think about black box and white box testing. Uh, heading into the guided practice on Thursday and heading into the quiz uh, over the coming uh, week. So to that end, um, we have some slides here, and these may look a bit familiar if you took 2110 with me, as I'm using a similar working example, albeit using Python rather than Java here. Uh, so in the couple videos ago, we talked about black box testing and white box testing. We also talked about gray box, which is kind of a middle point between these, but we're gonna focus on black box and white box here. Black box testing is designing tests either without having written the code or without the code in mind. And we're emphasizing just the, um, the change uh, from input to output, the change in state of the system, etc. White box testing, however, we're actually gonna look at how the code is written. And I'll show a way to do that later using PyCharm. I know many of you are using VS Code. Uh, I myself actually quite like PyCharm, so that's what I'm used to. That's where I'm gonna show this. But everything I do, there are uh, plugins for VS Code to do that. Uh, so just a quick little black box test-driven development example. Let's say you were writing a function, uh, and in this case, I actually have it written like a Java function, so let me just change that to a def, quickly remove these. Um, I actually have edited the rest of the slides, I swear, I just forgot that one line. Uh, so let's say you were writing this function in Python. The function calculate bill for a student's semester, and let's say that hypothetically this took in some number of courses that the student took, some amount that is already overdue, that is amounts that they have not paid yet from previous terms, and then a exemption as to whether or not they're exempt from interest uh, on that previous amount. So the first thing is, generally, you get courses at a bulk rate. The more courses you take, the less you're paying per course in this hypothetical university uh, whose bill I'm calculating. So say you take less than three, you take one or two classes, say $1,000 a class. But if you take kind of a typical full time schedule load, three to six, uh, three admittedly a bit low, but you know, in grad school, I only took four classes total. So in, in my PhD program, so, you know, I took two classes a term. Um, in, uh, you know, so that's 6,000 per course. If you're taking more than six, so seven or more, that's 5,500 to get a little bit of a discount. However, so that is your total amount. However, if you owe more than $2,000 from a previous term for any reason, oops, uh, that total is increased by 10%. You're effectively charged uh, more because you have an outstanding amount due. Additionally, the overdue amount and just the overdue increases by 10% if exempt is false. Call that interest. But if exempt is true, you don't have to pay interest. So that 10% is ignored. And, and I should note, this is done after step two. Um, so from there, we just simply return the sum of the total overdue. Now, this is a specification. This is a pretty specific specification for a function. It's very implementable, right? I can design test cases for this. So let's actually do that. Let's not try to right out of the gate implement this function. Instead, let's think about the first thing we need to do is just write a stub. And we're gonna write a stub like this. Purpose of the stub, we can compile. Well, in Python, we don't compile, but we can still write tests that call the function calculate bill with those three arguments. And all the tests will initially fail. We're okay with this. Because the point is, we just want to write the tests as a way of formalizing this is what the function needs to be outputting uh, based on these particular inputs. So, something to take in mind. Uh, were these, jo were these uh, Java variables, you could calculate how many tests would be exhaustive. Uh, were these Java ints, ints, and... Um, or int and int 
for the number of courses, a double for the overdue, and a boolean for exempt. Well, that would be 2 to the 32 possible ints, 2 to the 64 possible doubles, 2 possible boolean values. That's 2 to the 97 possible tests you could write, which is a really, really, really big number. But based on that specification, my question is this. If we have a test case that takes into account a student who has four credits, do we desperately need, do we really, really need another test case where the student has five credits? Because after all, based on the specification, they both fall into this bucket, right? So do we need two separate test cases inside of this bucket? Maybe not. Sorry, I added a sneeze button. Um, if we have a test for eight credits, then <laughs> the sneeze button is At least it didn't work that time. Sorry. Um, again, they fall into the same bucket. Do we really need to, to have those tests? If we have a test with overdue equal to 2,500, do we need a separate test for 3,000? No, we don't. So these tests would arguably be redundant. And as we talked about, while we want to do as many tests as we need, we don't want to do, we don't need to test so much so that it actually wastes time. Time to market is a risk factor. So what we can do is we can break up this into, and you'll hear the term equivalence classes or equivalence partitions. The point is they are groups of inputs that behave largely the same. And since we have three groups of inputs, let's look at courses. With courses, we take into account, well, there's three groups of inputs. One or two, three to six, and greater than, I should say, or equal to seven. With overdue, overdue, it's, it's less than or equal to 2,000 and greater than 2,000. With exempt, we have true and false. So now we have three classes, two classes, and two classes. Now, if we were to combine every possible combination of partitions, we're looking at 12, 3 times 2 times 2. But we don't actually need to test every combination of our, of our partitions. Now, some we may want to test because they might be uniquely related. But in this case, if we're talking about a bare minimum, a bare minimum number of tests to write, we want to cover every partition once. And that takes as many tests as the dimension with the smallest number of part or the largest number of partitions excuse me so in this case overdue has two partitions exempt is two courses has three so we need to write at least three tests could we try to be exhaustive with the partitions obviously not exhaustive total but with the partitions and write 12 tests we could except when you start getting into functions with a lot of state variables at play all those partitions can really, I mean, they, they literally grow exponentially. So if you're thinking about where's the bare minimum, it's something to cover every partition at least once. And so I can design these tests right here without having, I haven't written any code yet, but I can tell you how these inputs should behave with just a calculator, maybe a sheet of paper. First. We have three partitions, courses one and two, three through six, and greater than seven, greater than or equal to seven. So I have partition one, or I have test number one, courses is two. Test number five, uh, test number two, excuse me, courses is five. Test number three, courses is eight. Similarly, I have two overdue partitions, greater or less than or equal to 2,000 and greater than 2,000, and I color coded them. So test one and three use the first partition. Test 2 uses the second. Exempt. True and false. I have test 2 use true. I have test 1 and 3 use false. From there, with just by hand, I can calculate the actual output based on specification. And these are those numbers calculated by hand. And I can use that to write my tests. Now, I don't have the actual output yet. Because remember, in order to get the actual output... We need to have implemented the function, and I'm not there yet. I'm only writing my black box tests. And these tests are black box because I haven't written the code yet. There's no code knowledge for me to leverage in writing my tests, so I haven't written it yet. I'm writing the test based on the specification. So let's see an example of what such a test would look like. 
Well, here is test number one from the slides. And my camera is wonky. You don't need me that big. This is test one. So I define my inputs, each as variables. And this will come in handy because I can quickly... Um, it makes the test very readable to define the variables this way. And I can actually do a lot of copying and pasting of the test and just changing certain fields to help out. So I define, this is test case one, courses two, overdue 2000, exempt false. You'll see that that matches up with this slide. My expected value is 20,350. 20,350. From there, I run the function actual bill calculate underscore bill courses overdue exempt. And then I generate an assertion. And now I should note that with uh, Python, um, you can use assert equals for pretty much anything except floats. The problem with floats is that floats are imprecise. They are very, very slightly different. And what you can run into, for example, is the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 does not equal 2.0 in Python or in any, uh, any floating point language that follows the ANSI standard. Sorry, my cat is is just going absolutely ballistic over here while I'm trying to teach. Sorry about that. Uh, oops. And so, we use almost equal, and in this case I'm using places two. That is to say, it is equal to two places, because, you know, I'm dealing with dollars and cents here. And in American currency, we that's as far as we tend to go. So if it's equal within two places, I'm happy. And then I add this extra error message, which you should always add this extra error message. This is just to help me identify uh, which test went wrong. And you can see that I specify the inputs here. It makes it so I can quickly read the message and diagnose what would happen. But the key is the expected and the actual. I'm asserting that my expected value should equal my actual. And if this fails, then my test will fail. And if this passes, then my test will pass. And quickly from there, I can write three more tests, actually rather simply, simply by pasting. And if I want to define test two, then what I'm going to do is go back to my slides. Five, 1500 true. Five, 1500 true. My expected value in that case Oops, that is Photoshop. You don't need to see that. Uh, I was using Photoshop to put together the, the slide title. Um, I expected 31,500. Let's go ahead and put that in. 31,500. From there, I just want to update this error message so that way this error message doesn't mislead me. It points me to the right test. And here we go. It has too many blank lines. Fine. There we go. Want to make sure. Fix the style warnings here. Okay. And then from there. Test 2. Or excuse me. Test 3. Again going back to the slides. 8. 2500 false. 8. 2500 false. My expected was. 51,150. Let's make sure I got that right. I did. And so I changed these as well. And you see how quickly, after I wrote this first test, how quickly I was able to write more. Now, if you've not seen unit tests in Python before, it should be noted, you have to put all your test methods in a class. The, the methods can only take in the self argument, uh, as you see here. And they simply just all run, uh, you know, more or less in parallel. Think of them running that way. And you can do additional things. So if you're familiar, you can write a setup function that will run before all the tests. You can write a tear down function if you want to. And it's certainly worth practicing that. But in this case, I don't have any objects. So I'm just going to use what I have here. And the advantage of writing it out this way is I think it makes it very clear in the test what the inputs and the expected output are. So that way, uh, if you run into a failure, 
it gives you very clearly what the failure case was. So from there, let's say I implement bill and I implement the calculate bill function as follows. Quick, does anyone see any defects? Probably not, because you can't look at code and tell whether or not it has defects. But we now have these tests. So if after I wrote these tests, I wrote this code, I can now run these tests. I'm going to run um, build test. And you'll see that down here, um, ran seven tests. Okay, oops, that's not correct. Uh, the wrong test run. Ran three tests. There we go. Ran three tests, okay. That means all three tests passed. Ignore this over here because this was me working on some things uh, before going live with this recording. So, reasonably, if all three of my tests are passing, that means all three tests, the expected and the actual, are uh, matching, then that means, hey, my tests work, therefore my code works, right? No. No. It doesn't necessarily. And remember, you can never prove your code works. But we can certainly improve our certainty here. And a useful tool, and uh, I should note in PyCharm, this is not in the Community Edition. You have to have the Pro Edition. Um, but if you're using VS Code, I know there's plugins to do this. One thing is we don't want to be submitting any code. Because let's say we were putting this uh, into, into a production line. We wouldn't want to submit any code we haven't tested. And I can tell you right now that there are lines of code here that have not been tested. Because I know there's actually a bug in this code. I know because I intentionally put it there. But how are we going to find it? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to determine, well, where, where is this code we haven't tested? Because if there's code we haven't tested, chances are that's where the bug is going to be. And this is where it's useful to talk about white box testing, because now that we have code written, we can uh, discuss how we're going to measure how much of the code has been written. Now, before we move on to that, there is another thing to talk about in a black box way, and that is robustness testing. And robustness testing is when we're designing tests uh, for uh, states that are syntactically valid, but semantically meaningless. And this is especially true in Python, where data types are not enforced. For instance, what if courses is banana? No, no one knows what to do with that. But uh, similarly, if, what, what if courses is negative three? What if courses is 257? No student could take close to that number of courses. What if overdue is less than zero? Maybe this is, a, maybe it is a student overpaid a previous term and we need to take this into account. Uh, maybe it's not, it should never be possible. I don't know, we need to go to the customer and ask and rework the specification to account for this. But robustness testing, generally, we think of it in a black box way. And the idea, again, syntactically valid, which in Python is almost anything, uh, but semantically meaningless. So from there, with white box testing, or sometimes called glass box testing, we're now going to write tests with the source code in mind. And so we're going to look at code coverage. And there's a few different ways to measure code coverage when we're talking about testing. There's statement coverage. What percentage of the statements have been executed? Less than a 100%, why are there statements in our code that we haven't tested? Condition coverage is a special case, which means that uh, all Booleans have been tested where they are either true or false, whether that's a Boolean variable or an expression. Uh, this requires a bit more work because, you know, even in a given uh, statement, there may be a Boolean variable that's not used in an if statement, and we want to test it both when that variable is true and when it's false. Branch coverage. For every if, do we evaluate the if, the else, any of the, do we evaluate all the elifs? But also for every loop, do we evaluate normal iteration? What about one pass through the loop? What about zero passes through the loop? We want to have test case for that. Now, to be clear, each of these gets kind of more time consuming to write tests for. Path coverage is we take every possible path through our code. And in that case, that can be interesting because like, for example, if I were to have, um, and I'll go to Py PyCharm and write this real quick. If I were to have a file like, uh, 
if uh, and I'm just gonna a equals int input give me number something like that let's say that we have four variables and you could think of these as inputs to a function rather than inputs uh, done by the user but if I were to have these four variables and I might have some statement like this if a greater than b sorry my 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 java senses are kicking in if a greater than b statement one else if uh or else statement two and then further down we have statement three and then if uh c greater than d statement four else statement five um something like this we actually have four paths through this code because it's possible that we go statement one then three then four or one then three then five or two then three then four or two then three then five so we could get a hundred percent branch coverage even 100% conditional coverage here without getting 100% path coverage. And if you have particularly complicated functions, it can be hard to get this path coverage. But at least be aware that it is a relevant thing to consider because it's possible that statement two does something that causes statement five to crash. That doesn't appear when we go one, three, five or two, three, four. Just keep that in mind. So in this case, how can we quickly check which lines of code we've, uh, we've executed? Well, we could do debugging and tracing and count up that way, but there are some automated tools to help. For example, run with coverage. And if we run with coverage here, you'll see that most of these lines are green except for line 14 and line 17 and 18. And these lines are red because of our three tests, None of our tests execute these lines ever. You know, in, in the case of us reaching the if statement at 13, we only test where this is false, and so we move on to the else. We never actually reach this else because either this if statement was true or this elif was true. So let's consider how can, what inputs do we need to reach these lines of code to test them. This is the white box way to think. So, for example, I may find that um, in this, uh, and I have this here, it, it, this, these last two lines. We never reach these last two lines. Let's consider that line of code that we miss. Um, what do we need to do to reach that line? Well, in order to reach this line, we need uh, either overdue to be uh, greater than 2000 or exempt to be false to get past the first if statement here. And then we need overdue to be less than 2000 get past this if statement. So this tells me that I need exempt to be false and overdue to be less than 2000 to reach this if. So I designed that test case, overdue less than 2000, exempt false, and I can pick the course number because that's not relevant to this branch. Let's just go with five. I can then calculate my expected output by hand, which would be 31,650. From there, I go to my build test. I create a new test. We're going to call this test four. I'm then going to say courses five, overdue amount was 1500, and exempt was false, which is what I had in my slides. And the expected was 31,650. And then I'm going to just simply run the tests again. Let's run, and let's run with coverage too. So you notice four tests, oops, you can't see all of this. Sorry about that. Four tests passed. And when I look at the code, you'll see that now these two lines are green because I've executed them. But that still leaves line 14, which has not been executed. So let's 
see what we need to do to get there. This condition has to be false, so either overdue less than 2,000 or exempt false. In this case, in order to reach this line, we do need overdue to be greater than 2,000. So this is inside of this if statement. So overdue must be greater than 2,000. And exempt, because we're in the uh, if statement, must be true. So I've narrowed it down to I need a test case where overdue is greater than 2,000 and exempt is true. So let's design that test case. Overdue, 2,500, exempt, true. There we go. Uh, the expected with five courses is going to be 35,500. So let's write that test. Build test, I'm going to write test five. Courses five, overdue, 25, exempt, true. And it was reminding myself 35,500. So 35,500. Oh, and I forgot to actually edit edit the messages here. You want to make sure that you're editing the messages. Uh, that way your error messages are valuable. So now I'm going to run this test. Oops, I accidentally indented this. That's going to be a problem. Okay. Let me just uh, fix this real quick, sorry. The one downside of Python is the indents actually mattering, and I, I don't personally like that. Um, all right, so now let's run this test. And uh-oh, one test failed. Well, which test failed? Let's take a look. Trace back, blah, blah, blah. Assertion error, 35,500 35, is not equal to 37,050 within two places. So this is telling me that this test, this fifth test I just wrote, is failing. Well, why is it failing? Well, if you take a look at the specification, going back to that, uh, you'll see that the specification says, um, and again, we're, we're, we know we're dealing with a case where overdue is greater than 2,000 and exempt is true. So we need to increase the total by 10% because the overdue is greater than 2,000. But we do not do this step. The penalty is waived. Uh, the overdue doesn't change if exempt is false, uh, which in this case... Uh, it's not, excuse me, so we actually do need to apply the 10% the penalty, sorry. Um, hang on, let me remind myself, I'm, I'm not braining correctly here. Yeah, so in this case, they are exempt. So we're not applying the penalty, it's true, they are exempt from the interest uh, in this case. But they still get uh, the 10% increase cost uh, per course because the overdue is greater than 2,000. Going back to the slides, let's consider what that would look like. That would look like, okay, whatever total is times 1.1, because we increase it by 10%, plus the overdue amount, but the overdue amount does not increase. Well, let's take a look at what we wrote. Return overdue times 1.1 plus total. Uh-oh, silly us. We accidentally put this times 1.1 on the wrong variable. It shouldn't be overdue times 1.1. It should be total times 1.1. Ah, we're so silly. We always make that mistake. But now that I have fixed that, I want to note I run, and now all five tests pass. If I had just gone off my black box tests, I never would have found that. But... Because I took the time and analyzed and made sure that I've tested every line of code, that's one less bug that's made its way to production. Uh, while we're here, I want to take a brief moment just to explain how to test when we're dealing with object classes that have side effect and state. 
What is important to note here, and I have a, a fruit fly buzzing around. I think I got it. Um, what is important to note here is that let's say we had some object called num changes, and it kept track of an init of a number and how many times that number has been changed. So we have a function that you pass in a new number. If the new number is different from the old number, you update the number and you increment the number of changes. Pretty simple class, right? This is the only really relevant function. These two functions are just getters. This is the only mutator. But I want to test this class. So I have two fields to test. And so what you'll notice is that for every function I test, I'm actually testing it twice. I do, first I create my number object. I call, uh, so I create as initially five. I call change number to seven. And then I check and make sure that the changes is now one, because initially change is a zero. I've not changed the number. I've just set its initial value. This call changes it. So now it has one change. And by the way, this code uh, is uploaded. If you check the description of this video, uh, it's uploaded to the uh, course website. Similarly, so I need to test the number of changes. I also need to test that the actual number has changed, that now the number is seven. Now you could, and you can, do the following. You can do both of these assert statements in the same test, and therefore write one less test. And this is fine, but I would actually discourage you from doing this. And the reason is that um, if this assert statement fails, you, you never actually see whether or not this assert statement fails. And it could be that these are both failing for a common problem, but you'll only see that one fails and it might give you the wrong picture debugging. So having one assert statement per test can help you with debugging, but the key is, you know, you have to, you have to test not just the variable that should change, but any side effects. Similarly, you should test when side effects should not happen. For example, if I set the number as five and I call change number five, well, that's not a change. It's the same number. The changes should say zero. It should not change, but I need to test that. Similarly, the number doesn't change. It's five. I need to test that. So I'm just making sure, for instance, even that my getters have no side effects, as you can see here. So I'm not just testing the function output. I'm testing the state of the system after the function call, including side effects that should happen and side effects that should not happen. It's important to test both because oftentimes your bugs will come from side effect changes that should not happen. And if you don't test them, you won't find that those side effects are happening when they should not. Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, that's the last video that I'm going to post. That's the kind of help you think about black box and white box in a more concrete way, uh, heading for the guided practice and the quiz. And I will see you in class tomorrow as I'm recording this on Monday, but I assume many people won't see this until after class. Either way, take care.